Hey, well, very nice to see um, that we have people um, joining from across the globe. Um, I think we should get started um, and I will, um, as part of the CMS In Touch team, um, will start this session and um, introduce both the speakers as well as um, uh, the topic of today. Um, so let me just get into it. So welcome to this second event on inspiring methods. Um, we uh, have this, um, this we've set up this as a series so that we can have more and better discussions about what methods we're using um, and also about um, how we might re-envision the methods that we use. So before I introduce today's topic and speakers, I want to make two statements of solidarity and respect. So in Australia, where my acad academic home is located, it is common to start a session with an acknowledgement of country. So I'm not currently in Australia, but still want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that my work is, resides on the land of the Kulin Nations, and that I know that some of our speakers today also have their academic residences on stolen land. I want to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging of the land that I'm doing my intellectual work on and also extend that respect to the First Nations people that attendees and speakers today are located on. Secondly, the CMS in Touch team wants to acknowledge that there are strikes happening for a number of our academic colleagues around the world, including the UK, the US and other locations. As CM at CMS in Touch, we are thinking about how we can stand in solidarity with those movements that seek better academic and social conditions. So we are currently drafting up a policy about how we can best organize our events to allow the most participants um, um, to join, but we appreciate your patience while we're trying to craft a considerate policy. And if you have any suggestions about how we can stay better informed about strikes uh, around the world um, or how we can express solidarity, we very much appreciate that. Okay, so now on to the topic of today's event. This is a second session in our Inspiring Methods series, as I already mentioned. Um, and in this series, we have discussions about methods that are new or are allowing us to uncover new stories or new dynamics in relation to organizing. And that is something that we're focused on today as well. But before I get to that, just want to quickly highlight that you will have the opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A of Zoom. And so please ask your questions there rather than in the chat function, because it allows us to sort of group um, and filter through questions a little bit easier on our end. So what brings today's speakers together is that they've all tried to service the stories of neglected women in different country contexts. What also brings them together is that they have recently published great books on it. And so I will quickly mention those books in the order of who will be speaking when. So first we'll have Dr. Kristen Williams, who will be um, speaking about her book that discusses the contributions that female management theories have made to the MOS, the Management and Organization Studies discipline. And then next we have Dr. Leila Jamjoub, who will be speaking about her book that really tries to resist and revert the one-dimensional image that we have of Saudi Arabian women in organizational contexts. Dr. Mariana Paludi um, is also speaking about her book that recently came out that um, talks about or it gives voice um, to the um, Chilean academic women um, and their biographies. So these speakers will together be discussing how they approach how they approach the data collection as well as analysis for these books um, and that um, with a focus on how it helped them give voice to unrecognized voices. So I know that they can do much better justice to their work themselves. So I'm now gonna pass on to Kristen Williams to speak first. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you can see that now. Can you share my screen? You're in the spotlight now. You still need to share your screen, I think. Oh, perfect. 
How's that? Great. Awesome. Well, good morning. My name is Kristen Williams. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging that in Canada, which is part of Turtle Island, we are all treaty people. I'm located in Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This land is governed by the treaties of peace and friendship that were first signed in 1725. I also want to recognize the over 400 year history of communi communities of African descent and the 50 distinct African Nova Scotian communities located throughout the region where I live today. I wanna to thank CMS in Touch for providing this forum for us to discuss empowering methodologies. And I would also like to express my gratitude to my friends, Mariana and Leila. It's a great honor to share this space with you. I wanna start by telling you about the women in my book. I will then describe how I developed an advocacy-based methodology called Fictofeminism. And I will conclude with some tips for how you might try this method for yourself. Frances started her career in social work long before it was a recognized profession. In the early 1900s, settlement houses were developing to address a variety of social needs. And Frances was drawn to the sector after studying working conditions in factories and especially the conditions for women and children. Management theory's history is a relatively new subject, developing significantly between the 1940s and the 1960s, and several theorists residing outside of management were co-opted into management history as forerunners. Some of these are undoubtedly familiar to you, engineers like Frederick Taylor and psychologists like Henry Mayo. This co-option was very selective and did not include leaders in social work, government, labor, the arts, civil rights. It was also largely focused on male white thought leaders who were able to contribute to the dominant narrative of profit and, prof and productivity. Even today, Taylor Scientific Management is core studies in undergraduate business education in Canada. During her career, Frances was promoted through various positions that were concerned with labor and ultimately became the chairperson and then the industrial commissioner of the New York Department of Labor. She occupied many firsts, but the most famous first was when she was recruited to US President Roosevelt's cabinet as Secretary of Labor in 1933, where she served with him until he died in 19, 1945. Indeed, she was not only the first woman cabinet minister, but she was also one of the longest serving cabinet ministers in the US. Unfortunately, many of Frances's accomplishments were credited to Roosevelt, but she was the real architect behind the New Deal, shaping public policy and redefining working conditions. Those unfamiliar with the New Deal, it was a series of widespread socioeconomic programs introduced between 1933 and 1938 in response to the Great Depression. This focus was not only about stabilizing the economy, but also improving working conditions. And these policies included minimum wage, the 40-hour work week, unemployment insurance, and the abolishment of child labor. It was Francis's roots in social work that gave her a unique perspective on economic life and human rights. She believed that social work theory should inform business practice and argued for the welfare of people as being central to enterprise. Prior to being appointed the director of the Federal Theater, Hallie was already a renowned playwright and theater, at, theater director at Vassar College. Her work as a producer was celebrated by T.S. Eliot and many other notable dramatists. In 1933, she was appointed to lead the first federally funded national theater. As part of the New Deal under Roosevelt and Francis, the Works Progress Administration was formed to find new ways to put those on relief roles back to work. And not just doing anything, but applying the very skills and expertise that they had. The Federal Theater was arguably one of the most ambitious and novel labor programs in US history. But for some reason, it was not only overlooked by management and organizational studies, but by theater as well. If Hallie had not written her book, Arena, and the faculty at George Mason University had not stumbled across the archive of the Federal Theater, Hallie's story and her accomplishments might have been lost forever. As it was, the archive was actually misplaced for 50 years. 
Hallie's life gives us insight into a female model of leadership that is unquestionably successful. At its peak, the Federal Theater employed more than 12,000 workers and delivered nearly 64,000 performances in 32 states to over 30 million people. Due to the Relief Act, the program had to employ the majority of workers from 10 different unions currently on relief rolls, and 90% of the funds had to go to wages. Now, remember, this was not Broadway, but they had to compete with the conventions of Broadway. Additionally, almost overnight, movie houses had popped up all over the U.S., increasing this competition. What Halley did had never been done before. It was of nearly unimaginable scope, and she was subject to a very hypercritical political climate. And she had the lives of desperate workers and their families hanging in the balance. Management history has been largely an American project, despite many figures who made incredible contributions to management theory and practice. And in Madeline, I found a fellow advocate and a feminist. She was scrappy and fearless, and she spent over eight decades fighting for the rights of women, children, immigrants, indigenous people, and differently abled persons. She fought for human rights, for fair labor practices. She established the Canadian Federation of Unions, bringing more ownership into Canadian hands. She refused to see the development of the economy, management practice, labor policy, and human rights as separate. She began her advocacy at university, but it wasn't long before she was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with police and management at massive textile factories in Quebec at just 24 years of age. She quickly found herself in the crosshairs of politicians who, over the course of her career as a labor and union organizer, ordered her arrest no less than five times. Many saw Madeline as a bit of a radical. It was not uncommon in this pre-Cold War era to see feminism and strong women as synonymous with communism. The paranoia of the time was actually quite profound. Additionally, those on the side of the worker could not be seen as on the same side of management, and government was adopting legislation which made it much harder to negotiate in good faith. Amazingly, Madeline never felt like the effort was a loss because in undertaking the effort to unionize, she felt she had the opportunity opportunity to teach the worker how to fight, why to fight, and that gave people the courage to, to uh, take on additional efforts. Madeline ushered in a new order in Canada. No one understood the a priori of conditions and workers of workers better than she did. She worked hard to ensure that change was supported by the formation of key programs, policies, a broad range of measures to safeguard the worker. Viola was an African Nova Scotian woman operating in the time of segregation. She was not just any successful businesswoman, she was an extraordinarily successful entrepreneur, business professional, community leader, and mentor. The most have come to know her just recently as Canada's Rosa Parks, challenging racial segregation in a local theater in 1946. She was a forerunner in a business, in a new business, and built a new profession from the ground up. She opened up her first business in 1937. It was a salon that was specifically devoted to Black women. It quickly became a standalone store and was soon followed by a second business in which she sold her own handmade products and handcrafted uh, products through Atlantic Canada and Quebec. Her third business was a training school in which she helped other young women achieve similar economic independence. She was keen to help women in her community transcend the same intersectional barriers of race, gender, class that was compounded by the traditional post-war contours of life, which offered very limited employment opportunities for women. She had a simple but strict format for her success. She had an unflinching commitment to her business she was dedicated to learning and staying competitive, and her customers always came first. We're only beginning to understand the experience of racialized entrepreneurs, and Viola was an outstanding example of an incredibly successful entrepreneur operating under conditions which are, quite frankly, hard to fathom. I want to finish by sharing some of the lessons that I carry with me uh, from these women. From Francis, I learned that the democracy of the kitchen table is much more powerful than the board table, and that through conversation, nearly everything can be figured out. 
I also learned that achieving social welfare and the principles of sound economics are not at cross purposes. From Hallie, I learned that the work must be meaningful for all and that tenacity and wit will get you far. <laughs> I learned that you can serve a creative heart in unlikely times and unlikely environments. From Madeline, I learned that you always need to be prepared to do your homework. Her intellect could scarcely be rivaled. I also learned that sometimes you do have to fight for those who do not have the same rights as you and that such fights are actually a very important part of a civil society. From Viola, I learned that we all need to be just a little bit brave. If she could do what she did when she did it, what possible excuses do we have? Victofeminism is both a method and a way of writing. It's also a strategy for studying the past and promoting neglected subjects. I'm a feminist polemicist, which means that I fundamentally believe in the power of emotive writing, polemics of the heart, and the power of these things to, to enact personal agency, social change, and social justice. As someone who studied and admired these women for years, I was inspired by the idea of having a conversation with them, and that's the foundation of victofeminism. I wanted to develop a plausible, powerful, and persuasive account of an overlooked female figure that would create emotional engagement in my readers. Victofeminism is a, a postmodern pro-woman activist method for two reasons. One, it confronts the taken-for-granted strategy of reconciling the historic record by simply adding in these missing pieces. And it offers a powerful alternative account. And in this way, it allows women in the present to access historical female mentors, organizational theories, and insights into alternative methods of practice. The method draws on collective biography, autoethnography, and fictocriticism. Collective biography is described as this ambling style of developing a narrative. You bring together many active voices and you interweave them to develop a biography. In the research process, this might be a conversation, but for me, it was a conversation that I had with various traces of her past. Autoethnography is a very personal way to investigate. We use ourselves to be interpreters and sense makers about the things that we see. We blend our values with the research process and we accept that our understanding produces new and worthy knowledge. In this way, I advocated for my own voice in the research process while simultaneously advocating for my protagonist or my subject. I drew on the rhizomatic capacity of fictocriticism, which is an approach that rejects the confines of academic convention, and it assumes that there's no one way to write about either fact or fiction. It also blends writing styles like essays and narratives. And for me, fictocriticism gave me the opportunity to see how literary devices um, and literary nonfiction could serve to make historical figures more believable. It also allowed me to engage my readers as though they might be reading a novel or a play. The outcome of the method is a non-fiction, non -fiction, fictional encounter with a historical figure with the intention of raising her profile and voice and servicing what we might have overlooked in terms of her lessons and contributions, both to the field of management and organizational studies, but also to management history. I drew on various sources to develop this faithful but fictional conversation. These sources included archival records, congressional hearings, various reports, autobiographies, news media, and very importantly, first voice accounts. In writing for another, I do bear the responsibility of taking a cautious approach, which represents my protagonist's own agency, and this requires great reflexivity. But let me tell you something, there has been so much masculinist gendered writing that the opportunity to offer an unapologetic feminist gendered account in service to women is extremely powerful. So let me leave you with some practical advice for how you might try this method for yourself. First, find a historical figure that inspires you. For me, this was not difficult, but I needed enough information to develop a plausible account. You need to develop a confident command of your sources. I spent years with these women. Read deeply as you will need to navigate across many sources to create a coherent narrative. And don't fall into the trap of looking in the usual places. Some sources might really surprise you. Personal writings are very helpful and they will give you confidence about how to fill in the gaps. 
approach the scene faithfully and use literary devices to set the fictional scene and place your protagonist in a realistic time and place. And draw on sources that give you a sense of the socio-political environment for realism and insights into her context. Finally, have fun. It is a really cathartic way to write. I want to leave you with some recommended reading for the women that I've been talking about. So in addition to my own book, which I hope you'll read, um, I hope you'll read these books too, because they really were inspiring for me. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Kristen. Um, that was really, really interesting. Um, I think up next is Dr. Leila Yamun. Yes, I am next. So can you everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So good afternoon from rainy Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, my name is Leila Jamjoum, and I am a research fellow at Dar al-Hikmah University. And it gives me great pleasure to be a part of the Inspiring Methodologies series organized by CMS in Touch. I really want to thank CMS in Touch for the generous space that they've created for knowledge sharing and community building, where really they have focused on the relationality of research and research practices. And I'm very honestly inspired by the work that they have done over the past two years and the work that they continue to do. So thank you for the platform. Today, I've I titled my talk, Surfacing Neglected Stories, Interviews as an Empowering Methodology where I will share more about my research and the methodology I've used to highlight Saudi women's stories in leadership. My work really has been an attempt to challenge the Western-centric lens of studies on leadership, really trying to add a cultural and contextual lens rarely explored in management and organization studies. And as you can see, I have the word empowering in quotation marks due to honestly this uneasiness I have with the term which suggests somewhat that someone or somebody or something is giving a helping hand to somebody else um, and giving them more power. Even the Oxford Dictionary defines empowering as the act of giving somebody more control over their own life or the situation they are in. And this is not the definition I've used in my research, and it's not the definition I wish to invoke here. Empowering to me in the work that I have done has really been an attempt to combat the evident emissions of situated knowledge in management and organization studies. I feel that I am more empowered because of my work and because of my research and because of the women I've interviewed. And I know that the field of management and organization studies is better and more empowered when it is more inclusive of voices from women from non-Western contexts. So a little bit of a backstory as to why I decided to, to do this research, which really points to how research is this really deeply personal, embodied, and political endeavor. And it all began when I worked as an employment advisor in the first job placement center for female job seekers here in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia in 2010. And as a part of my job, I would listen to a variety of Saudi women's stories. I would hear of their aspirations, their dreams, their ambitions, their frustrations, and even eventually get to see them land some really wonderful positions within the Saudi private sector. And it was the women's stories that drew me to the work, and I loved to hear it, and I would listen to their stories for hours on end. But I could never find that within the organizational literature. And what struck me was this profound neglect of Saudi women's stories in management and organization studies. And what I found instead was this really much this Orientalist representation of Saudi women, which either described them as being oppressed individuals in need of saving or being under the patronage of the male authority and the state. Even Saudi women's successes were always disguised under this discussion of workplace challenges. So we rarely got to see and hear of the ways in which the women constructed their leadership identities or hear of their leadership experiences or their stories or the ways even they resisted organizational challenges. We just kept hearing about all this insurmountable challenges that they were facing. What about the other side of the conversation? How are they moving away from the challenges? So my frustration 
pushed me really to counter what to me felt like this unchanging and fixed singular narrative. And I wanted to showcase the multiplicity of women's voices and stories. So I wanted to share the opening remark from my book where I state stories are powerful tools used to construct or deconstruct a particular way of thinking. Stories shape how we see the world and our perceptions of certain people. Stories color our lives, inform our subjectivities and our tools used to get to know one another. Well, aren't stories considered sources of knowledge? And I end up the paragraph with these few compelling questions that I really want the audience members to think about as they pursue their own research. How can we re-narrate dominant stories? How can we seek to understand, and I use here the other in quotation marks, how can we surface alternative perspectives if we continuously use dominant frameworks to seek to understand? So surfacing the stories really required that I segment my research into three stages, which to put it simply was a process of critique and reconstruction. I didn't just want to critique the master narrative. I wanted to reconstruct it. What does the alternative look like? So the first stage involved critiquing the current and sparse literature on Saudi women leaders in the workplace. And I call this the master narrative because it paints a singular story on Saudi women leaders, paints this monolithic Saudi woman. And the second stage comprised of conducting in-depth interviews with Saudi women leaders. And this stage, I call it, represents the counter narratives, where I really wanted to reject predetermined subject positions. I wanted to shatter the complacency of scholarship on Saudi women leaders. I wanted to hear the stories. This is that stage. And the third stage explored my narrative, which highlights my voice within the text. As Michael Bamberg says, the attempt to remain analytically unbiased strips individuals of their history. And so this stage really required that I position myself within the text, not only as a separate third category, but also interweave them within the women's stories. <clears throat> so I conducted in-depth interviews with 14 Saudi women leaders, and the women were vice presidents, directors, deans, senior managers, and heads of departments in a variety of different fields, which included education, oil and gas, fast moving consumer goods, banking and consulting. And they were located both in the private and public sector in three main cities in Saudi Arabia, Jidda, where I'm from, Riyadh and Ad-Dammam. And I really wanted the interviews to be deep and generative of stories and illustrative examples. I also wanted to achieve what Leila Abulurud calls an intimate familiarity with a woman. And she says this, and I, I just love this quote by Leila Abulurud in her book, um, Do Muslim Women Need Saving? Intimate familiarity with individuals anywhere makes it hard to be satisfied with sweeping generalizations about cultures, religions, or regions. So achieving that intimate familiarity could somehow counter the master narrative. This brings me to the how, how I conducted the interviews. And I'm saying this, and I'm by no means it is a prescribed formula, but it was a method that I felt was empowering to me. So first off, I treated each interview as a space for co-constructed knowledge, where knowledge was being co-constructed. This means I started each interview with a statement of my research objectives and my intentions of the work and why I was conducting the research. By doing so, I was sharing my goals and objectives of the research with the women, where they also felt duly responsible to achieving. I also wanted to engage in a dialogue with the women. And to be honest, even though I came in with in the interviews with a set of questions and probing questions, most often than not, they were left at the door. And I really wanted to see where the conversation was going, where it was going to go. I really wanted the women to lead the conversation. Um, this means that you as a researcher really have to be prepared for different avenues as no interview will be the same and really accepting the multiplicity of the process. And I write this to describe the interviews. The Saudi women leaders were willing to be very open with me, sharing very intimate details of their journeys. I was respectful of their stories and tried my best to give them the space to speak openly about their personal life experiences. I never interrupted their thought process and would ask for more elaboration only if needed. I listened actively to their stories and was easily able to understand them due to the ease of access they were willing to grant me. At times, 
I felt that the interviews took the form of a therapy session where I was listening to these women vent, cry, and reflect deeply on their journeys. At other times, I felt I was part of a one-on-one -on -one life coaching session where the interviews left me with so much motivation to perform and achieve my goals. Looking at the ways in which they juxtaposed their vulnerability along with their strength made them very approachable to talk to and made the interviews feel more like a heart-to-heart -heart than a formal research interview. I often left the interviews feeling very refreshed and energized with a deep interest to learn more from other Saudi women leaders. Their narratives, which portrayed a web of personal and professional stories, and the interplay of both displayed an intricate dance that was being performed between the two. This revealed a very humanistic side to them as individuals and as leaders, and I'm grateful to have taken part in such an intimate researching process. So interviewing really becomes this process for relationality and relationship building, really looking at that emotive connectivity. Here, I will talk about the challenges I faced with the analysis. And the first one being, how do you retell women's stories? And there are quite frankly, some representational decisions that you have to make when analyzing the women's stories. Which stories do I select? How do I order them and assemble the stories? And eventually, how do you write about them? And to be honest, I really struggled here because I feel the sense of responsibility. I have the sense of responsibility towards the women. I wanted to get it right. And I was really scared of somehow perpetuating the master narrative that I was trying to avoid. And so I had this internal rubric, so to speak, guiding my choices. The first one being I wanted to write against othering. This means where I could, I would leave the women's stories as standalone texts so the readers themselves could have the opportunity to read and understand the women. I also wanted to write from an ontological position which valued subjugated knowledge and not only critique them. This means resisting Eurocentric perspectives so to make space for alternative subjectivities to emerge. Unfortunately, even at times when you set out to approach your work in that way, you may be pulled into different directions through the review process. This also meant I had to be cautious around the liberal veneer surrounding definitions of agency. And this is where I found a lot of value in Siba Mahmoud's work in the politics of piety, where she states, Western ideals of agency are understood as the capacity to realize one's own interests against the weight of custom, tradition, transcendental will, or other obstacles. Therefore, I wanted to highlight the women and understand agency as one located within ethical, religious, and political conditions. So to give you a few examples, some of the women, for example, found agency by adopting this religious Islamic identity of being their best self or their insana saliha, which points to how leadership can be connected to something well beyond the organization. Others, while talking about their organizational savviness and the ways in which they overcame organizational challenges, really differentiated between two kinds of rules. Rules with a capital R, which are laws by God and cannot be changed, and rules with a small R, which could be broken, really differentiating between the two and overcoming organizational challenges within the process. Some women gave examples of phenomenal women in the Islamic world, and even they discussed the concerted effort to whitewash history, so they found strength by reading about wonderful role models from Islamic history. Some women discussed their leadership through familial terms, where they talked about their role as mothers in their organizations or in their departments, and how employees were somehow their sons and daughters. And if we look at Cantor's work and her discussion about motherhood and being adopting this mother role, she discusses it as a role trap, and not through a more contextual lens, accounting for how these familial roles can be used as a strategy for gaining acceptance. I also had to be very reflexive, not only by being explicit with my intentions and my own biases, I also had to recognize the power that I had and what I could say influence how I was representing the woman. And so in the rare times where I do move away from the woman's stories, I discussed at length my reasoning for doing so. Finally, while analyzing the women's narratives, I had to be careful that I wasn't only looking at the written text, but I also included other facets like the emotions, the actual length it took to retell a story, accounting for the silences and the pauses. And this way, this process privileges the, what the women found as being important. And so the data analysis process becomes 
a process focused on uncovering and recovering marginalized perspectives. So going back to the question I asked you all at the beginning of the presentation is how can we re-narrate dominant stories? And to be honest, it requires many voices and the surfacing of many more stories to break that singularity and break that homogenous narrative of that singular Saudi woman. And wonderfully, this has been the case here. Over the past two years, especially, there has been an increase of published works and dissertations highlighting Saudi women's successes building this intimate familiarity with the woman. So it definitely takes a village to chip away at the master narrative. And I want to end with this quote by Ronald Pelias, who writes about the need to move away from master narratives and toward local stories, away from idolizing categorical thought and abstracted theory and toward embracing the values of irony, emotionality, and activism, away from assuming the stance of a disinterested spectator and toward assuming the posture of a feeling embodied and vulnerable observer, away from writing essays and toward telling stories. And I hope you can all write more stories within your work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila. That, that was very interesting and in that I've been writing down references and things to read or think about for both of your presentations so far. Um, and if anyone has questions popping up, I see that there's already a few in the Q&A, keep writing them. Um, but we still have one presentation to go. And this is um, Dr. Mariana Paludi's presentation and her discussion of her book. So I'm just gonna give the floor to you now, Mariana. Mm, thank you very much. Let me start. Here. Can you see my presentation full mode? Yes, but your sound is a little bit low, so maybe you can. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank I could, you. Yeah, I, I, I will do this for sure. Well, thank you very much. And well, Liela, you set the bar really high. And also, Christine, <laughs> being the third one with these amazing presentations, it just uh, you inspire me and you set the bar very high. So, well, good afternoon to everyone. Good morning to people here in South America. My name is Mariana Paludi. I'm an assistant professor at Universidad Mayor and, and I'm right now talking to you from Chile in South America. Um, before I begin my presentation, I would like to thank CMS in Touch for the invitation and especially my colleagues, Christine uh, Williams and Lilia Jamju, colleagues and friends, uh, for asking me to share this space. Uh, I have this uh, very uh, thoughtful and inspiring conversation. And today I will be sharing with you how this book, Women and Science in Chile, uh, autobiographic tale from 21st century researchers, came about and particularly how I, during this journey, discovered that um, autobiographical methods unleash hidden voices and also what is the challenge uh, of doing research when scientists speak uh, them for themselves and not through interviews. I always want and I appreciate when they give me some context. And when I mean context here, I'm not trying to summarize uh, at all how Chile looks like. I'm just trying to give you context to explain why this book was so um, timely. I won't say important, but timely and why it just uh, it, it was launched. And, and let me start with what happened in 2019. Uh, we have feminist protests and strikes in universities against sexism and machismo. Basically, uh, students uh, all across Chile were complaining and uh, regarding the masculinity and, and sexism and the language and, and sexual harassment within the universities. But this is not a phenomenon that started in Chile. Actually, it's echoed by what happened in 2017. You remember the, the Mitchell movement and how uh, that actually allowed people to be uh, outspoken and more open regarding uh, sexual harassment. 
Also bear in mind that in South America, I will say in Chile and Argentina, also the country I come from, we are, students are very outspoken and very vocal about uh, inequality. In Chile in 2008, there was also uh, strikes and protests from students. So this is um, something that explains why uh, this happens. And but I think the interesting part here was that uh, during March uh, 8th, the Women Internationals Day, actually most universities in, in Chile were, um, were closed, were shut down. Female students, male students didn't allow anyone to get into. Um, so class were um, lost uh, for different universities. And... I wanted to also explain from the context why uh, this happened. So if you can see at the upper side of uh, your screen, you will see the picture of the Council of Deans of Chilean Universities. We call it CRACH here, which is basically uh, the 30 universities more prestigious. They are private and, and public, but they are the most prestigious in Chile. This is a picture of the council in 2018. As you can see, there's no woman in the picture. Uh, although from the twin, from the 30 members, there were one woman uh, at the time and 29 men. But if you see in the upper side of the picture, you see the same uh, group of people, 2022, and you can see a little shift, <laughs> a little bit, and you see 25 men and five women in the picture. So that explains uh, why the complaints and why it's been seen higher education as a masculine uh, field. And these are the groups and or this is the elite, we can say, that rules and um, think about the educational system and universities uh, in Chile. What about the context in the universities in itself? And now when I'm I'm being myself a little bit uh, auto-ethnographical. So um, in 2018, we are called, me as the gender expert and other researchers from different disciplines to have a meeting and to discuss about the situation. Imagine um, organizations, universities are institutions, they are uh, running around trying to make sense of what was going on. There were strikes in my uni own university, and they asked us to gather, have networking, and try to come up with a, a group, a network group, uh, like a, something uh, to give a response. At the same at the same time, there were other universities across Chile that they were developing policies or protocols. And so in this case, we are this group of researchers that we don't know each other. Um, and basically, we are in a very organic way trying to uh, give time with a solution, a workshop uh, or something regarding what was going on. So at this point, um, I, in a very organic way, took the lead uh, because I was used to doing research with gender. Um, and we start discussing what we can do. Some researchers thought about doing a paper together and discussing the situation of researchers in, in Chile. Um, some of them discussed doing workshops and sensitivity workshop, which is pretty common. But I like here to make a parenthesis and bring uh, car bikes where how can I know what I think until I see what I say? Because at that point, I didn't understand at all what was going on. We were just enacting, uh, and definitely now with the book in my hand uh, and the launch of the book this year, I could say that I, I know it will be a book, but at that point, I didn't do it. I didn't know it, and I think many of the projects we do, we have no clear vision where we're we going. Also, with, within this, this parenthesis, I wanted to say that many of us are very infused or influenced uh, with different uh, epistemological ideas, ideology, theories that come from books and readings. And if you can see over there, uh, one of that influence was the female postcard of the end of the world from Karina Yaseka, uh, who is a post-colonialist. She was doing research on segment indigenous populations. Uh, and as you can see in the picture, is, uh, she interviewed um, uh, the last um, segment uh, women alive. Um, 
also influenced by Borderless La Frontera de New Mestiza, Gloria Saldua, I use it for my thesis, and, and her book, if you didn't read it, I recommend it to do it because she is a poet, uh, she, was an, she was a poet, an academic, and her book theorized uh, marginalized people in terms of geography, where she was standing from, and also in terms of theory, uh, but most of her theories come from her own inner, uh, inner reflection of uh, who she was and where she was living. Uh, the third influence, kind of odd for some of you, is Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. These um, popular books about extraordinary women, they were somehow an inspiration to me in the sense that people were interested and in craving for this kind of uh, knowledge. Um, so... So as you can see, we are influenced uh, and we don't make sense of things only retrospectively, right? Uh, the autobiography, which is uh, the methodology I use in, in my book, which is not autoethnography, uh, it's focused on the relationship of our sense of self. So basically, we are in this case, we are telling uh, researchers to make sense of their own story, tell the story on their own voice, with little um, influence from the, the researcher in my case. You can see here two famous uh, autobiographies. One is from Katherine Johnson. Uh, one, she, well, there's a book about the three black women in NASA. She's one of them, um, Malala Shusef, as you know, she was shot by um, uh, Taliban's, uh, she's a Pakistani and she's a Nobel Prize winner. So these are good examples of how an autobiography looks like. So the book, the book is a compilation um, of 20 researchers from across Chile. We have, uh, uh, and this we can discuss that later, but we have different disciplines. There was the option to find uh, researchers that do research on gender and are already sensitive. But, but the problem for me with that is that I don't want sensitive feminists <laughs> talking about themselves because the purpose was to broaden up into different disciplines and try to find how actually women make sense of themselves without, without having that sensitivity as I do. So we have architects, nurses, theater um, experts, engineers, uh, people in researchers in microbiology, neuroscience, among others. And, and the the task was write three to 10 pages reflection about yourself focusing on who you are as a female and your researcher identity. You can see uh, in that picture is me and some of the of the women that did the, that that were part of the book. And as the main researcher, uh, and because of my bias, I tend to, of course, trying to find themes across uh, the researchers. Um, and I could say there was an interesting dance between similarities and differences, but let's talk about the similarities maybe now or, or the things that were similar. One of them, the influence. It was, it tried me that most of these researchers talk about their mother's and grandmother's influence. I did research with executive women in the past, and most of them talk about the father figure. So that's uh, that was an insight for me. The second uh, theme that it was very common across them is how they see themselves as their researcher as an identity, as much as being a female. Then um, they were all discussed about the woman condition in science, and I will give you some examples in the next slides. Maternity, maternity. We didn't ask them about, like to talk about anything more than being a female and being a researcher, but maternity um, appear in all the research tales in different ways, whether it's being a mother and how that transformed their, like, their responsibilities, what they do, but also who they are as, as mothers. And last but not least, race and class. I will say that class was something that appeared a lot. We have 20 researchers, some of them uh, upper class, uh, and, and many of them are from uh, worker class and their experience on how they get there and being the first um, university, um, the, the first member of, in the family to go to university was something that definitely makes a difference in their lives and in their family lives. So I'm going to quickly, I'm going to read the first one because I like it a lot. Uh, this is one of the extras from one of the researchers. 
She says, motherhood has been fundamental in my life. Sounds strange coming of a woman who did not want to have children. The maternity of my mother, that of my maternal grandmother, uh, that of other women in Chile, the Semen Maternity Hospital. I am Sandra Ramburu Carvacho, a 46-year-old woman, midwife and maternity are what I'm passionate about today. So interesting that a woman that, that didn't want to have children, maternity is what it's, she's passionate about. Then we have a quote from Susan Carroll, and also she talks about how her mother was a big influence. She's a feminist historian um, from the United States. Uh, Fabiola Arevalo Reyes, physicist. I love this uh, story. So in Chile, we have a, every year a program called One Self and Scientist, One Self and Classroom, in which teachers and professors go to um, schools and talk about the research. So Arevalo, uh, Fabiola tells in this story how she was invited as a keynote speaker. She went to school, and when the organizers received her, they they asked her to sit down. Then she she witnessed how they were running around trying to find out the keynote speaker. So she had to stand up and say, hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm coming here for the talk. I'm going to give the talk and I'm going to read this. One of them looked me up and down with a confused expression on her face. That's when I understood that I didn't look like an expert in supernova would look like. So I have one minute left and I, I wanted to go to my concluding thoughts. Um, as I said before, and I'm quoting uh, car bike, I didn't know at the point that the autobiography as a method was uh, what, what we call the feminist standpoint theory and what it means. And I think it's going, I, it's good to summarize what feminist standpoint theory brings to research and, and to methods. So feminist social science and scholarship must create theory grounded in the actual experience of language of women, says uh, Barbara Dubois. And, and the reason why is because most of our research and theory have been thought and explained through uh, a male lens. So it's time to uh, create an and actually use the women experience. Second, feminist standpoint theory challenged the notion of conventional scientific practices that had excluded women from the inquiry and marginalized them in every aspect of knowledge, benefits, and construction. And here, one of the big critiques against feminist standpoint theory is like, well, you why, why you essentialize women, why they're going to have a different point of view than men. So the question here is not about biology, it's about uh, situationality. So women's uh, standpoint theory is different because only people that have been marginalized and been suffering from power struggles uh, can uh, talk about that situation. Um, it's the same that saying only elite people can talk about their privilege. It's the same. So there's no way we can make an interpretation of it. We need their voice. Uh, third, study up. We're used to have research in feminism that is study up, uh, that is, sorry, study down. So we explain how the norms of society uh, shape culture and inequality uh, among men and women and other type of inequalities. Uh, standpoint theory brings study up. It makes people, it gives uh, women's voices and, and make them reflect on themselves. Uh, and to, to finish, methodological innovation. When you, you use uh, an autobiography, for example, it has a um, transformative power. It allows women, when they're writing their own stories, to uh, reflect on themselves and also to be creative. Uh, the writing process is creative in itself. So using this type of methodology also brings the, the empowerment and the transformation of uh, who they are by the reflection. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana. Uh, maybe if you can stop sharing your screen, we can move to the next section, which is the, the Q and A. Um, I'm just gonna make sure that everyone's visible. I am aware that we are running towards the end of the session, but um, if people wanna hang around a little bit to um, do the Q and A, uh, that would be really lovely, of course. Um, 
So we saw one question coming through um, already, and that was sort of directed at, at was directed at Kristen, but um, might be something that everyone uh, wants to refer to. How did you actually choose the the sub the subjects or the the women um, that you talk about as um, the stories that you wanted to display? Yeah, there was. Um... There was some criteria that was revealed by uh, first being introduced to Frances Perkins that I then applied to finding other women, but I was very fortunate. Frances Perkins was actually recommended to me by my mentor um, and supervisor at my PhD at the time and back in 2015. So I'm a practitioner turned academic, still working in both spaces, um, but on, I worked I work in the nonprofit sector, in the charitable sector. And so as a practitioner, he saw similarities with respect to not working in a in a corporatist space um and he thought that I might enjoy learning about her and indeed I did um and then with respect to identifying other women I uh found Hallie pretty uh, tangentially because she was another American associated with the New Deal um but then I was really desperate quite frankly to find some Canadian women um and I searched through a number of, of prominent Canadian women, knowing that I would likely find some overlooked lessons about management and organizations. And indeed, once I started researching them, it wasn't very difficult to see um, what their contributions might have been and how they might have shaped uh, present discourse or past discourse on on management and organizations. So it, it was a bit of an iterative process, but the criteria is that you need to have enough information to write about the women. And unfortunately, many women might, um, you might find traces of them, but you might not have enough to do the kind of work that I did with fictive feminism. And that's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, it, it there's a, there's no, <laughs> shortage of great women to write about. Uh, in fact, there's there's many that, that could be uh, surfaced and given a spotlight. And, and that I think is the, the very fortunate opportunity of this kind of work. Thank you for the question. Thanks so much. This was, um, let me just really quickly check. This was um, uh, John Jew's question. So thank you so much for that. We also have a question from Abru, um, who is asking about tensions around um, interviewing upper class members. Uh, uh, I guess quite a few of you, we could say that many of the women you've spoken to are higher class. Did you find any tensions there or, or were there specific reasons potentially for why that ended being the case? I'm happy for any one of you to take that question, but maybe um, Mariana or Leila can take it. I can have a go. Were you a part of my dissertation committee? Because that was one of the main questions I was getting. Um, so to be very honest with you, I think my selection of women in leadership was perhaps my resistance to the characterization of Saudi women as being you know, these hapless individuals incapable of climbing the organizational ladder. And I got this remark quite a lot from my from my committee members. It's like they're already upper class women who probably have it all. And and why did you select them? But when I talked to the women, most of them talked about how class was being constructed, how they didn't come into their leadership position all, already gaining a certain class. They they actually worked their way up. So I wrote this in, in my dissertation as class is being constructed. And also, I found this really, really great paper uh, that was published in organization studies on could a subaltern manage? Could a subaltern manage? Asking this, this main question, and it was published by Nidhi Sirnivas. And basically, the gist of it is saying that there are conflicting and changing social positions. So yes, a subaltern can manage and can be also considered, for example, a subaltern because they are a marginalized category or because there aren't enough women in leadership or so that doesn't deny the fact that there are other challenges that the women are facing. So that's how I approached it. Leila, how, um, so I, have, I don't want to take time for Mariana, do you want to go at it or there was another question in the chat that I it's so juicy. <laughs> Just, I, can I add something to yeah, that please. and then you answer yeah, yeah. to uh, Janju. Um, in my case, 
I didn't interview, but there were 20, uh, 20 stories and tales, and you can definitely see class as something very important. And, and I think that more than thinking about the tension between um, working class and upper class, uh, it's interesting to have in mind intersectionality framework to understand, okay, maybe we're talking about gender and feminism, but gender in, in some of the narratives, it wasn't as important as class. Especially, there is a, a narrative, uh, an academic that she, her father was uh, a, a indigenous, her mom Chilean, and she was really poor. And then, yeah, becoming a researcher means a high, like they, they become a, a, a person of an, a kind of an elite, right? A, a prestigious situation in, a, in a, doing a PhD and all of that. So uh, I don't know if there is a tension. It is different. I don't, it probably is a challenge. It is different to talk to somebody from an, an executive uh businesswoman uh that is a manager in ibm that uh, listening to somebody from a, a lower class even the vocabulary is different so uh i think it's an interesting question to bear in mind class and think if class gender who is going to be more important in the context of the the research Diela, i know you want to answer the question go for it <laughs> Yes, yeah, so Yeonju Cho asks, Leila, how do you define resistance from your perspective? Is it bounded by culture and religion? And yes, it is, because when I read Silva Mahmoud's work in The Politics of Piety, she talks about this virtue of al-haya, of humble, humble, humility or hum humbleness. And she talks about it, if you are looking at it through a liberal feminist perspective, this or a masculinist perspective, it would actually be frowned upon. It wouldn't be looked at as a good quality. It'd be like, oh, you're humble. Oh, but if you look at it from a religious standpoint, it was actually interesting to see how this informs women's subject positions. So I really loved how Saba Mahmoud's work says it's not against something. Resistance is usually looked at as something against something. You are resisting culture, you are resisting religion, you are, but what about alternative ways of, 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 of resistance? What about subtle forms of resistance? What about even religious forms of resistance? So this is why I love Saba Mahmoud's work in the politics of piety. And I really found a lot of resonance with what she said, because I didn't want to just construct resistance as being something against something, you know? So thank you for the question. I loved answering it. Thanks so much. Um, can I also uh, make sure that we answer um, Nina's question? So Nina asks, how do you see academia and scholarship shifting as a result of new feminist methodologies coming forward? Is that happening? Does anyone feel, this is a, a challenging big question. Does anyone feel like they have some reflections to offer on this? So it's a big one. I'm going to have to get Nina. I know Nina. I'm going to have to give her trouble for asking this question. Mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, the answer is yes and no, right? Um, I think you have to break it down. So you have to. So if you were to look at scholarship, is scholarship shifting? Yes, we have this, you know, exciting new tradition of writing differently that's being embraced by many different journals, and it's creating space and opportunity for subjectivity and a mode of writing and embodied writing to be present. And that is fantastic. But then you've got academia. And I think academia is, an, is a totally different thing. Um, and, and I have less experience probably than my colleagues with respect to that. But my, my exposure to academia is that it's very durably male and masculine and white. Thanks, that sums it up quite well. Mariana, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I do agree. I think you give a, you share a, a very good picture, Christine, and I do agree, it's yes and no. I have the sense, uh, it is a, this is my intuition, uh, that it's because this male dominant way of doing academia Maybe journals are opening a little bit, but I think that feminists have been working for a long time in these uh, new uh, or alternative ways of writing and doing research. I don't feel there, to be honest, I don't feel there is so much new things. There might be new titles and, and, and categories or names, uh, but I mean, 
I, I don't see that, that many things uh, that are new. And maybe in based on the question of Nina, of like, kind of like, do we have hope that uh, based on what happened the last years? And I don't know, I've been reading a lot of uh, the ethics of care. It seems to me that there is a moment in time after COVID that everybody was talking about the importance of care in society and feminism, and it just went away. So I'm not saying I'm pessimist. I'm a, not a realistic optimist. <laughs> so I, I feel uh, basically there is much to do. And I'm going to quote here my friend, Christine. There is uh, no shortage of women uh, of great women to write about. So we need to keep going, basically. <laughs> we don't need to stop. That uh, is such a good one to end on, but there is one more question. So we're going to just keep that as, as the, the sort of quote for this session, I think. But I do want to make sure that we also um, get this uh, question about um, the difference between semi-structured interviews and dialogues. And Leila, that was a question that was specifically mentioned for you because uh, you, you use that sort of method more. Did you feel like that was a, a difference or something that you sort of had to adapt? To? Uh, so to be honest, I mentioned within the book and also within the journal articles that I've published that I've used semi-structured interviews. And then when I was looking back and reflecting myself on, was it actually a semi-structured interview or was I engaging in something beyond that? Was it that, oh, I have these list of questions that I need to tick off? It wasn't that way. It was more generative of their stories. It was more reflecting with the women. It was more um, embodied and it was more emotional. And I let the women lead the way. And I was more like um, engaging with the dialogue with that they were willing to share with me. So I treasure the women's stories and I really feel a sense of responsibility that I have with them. That's great. Well, um, I think this is all that we have time for, but I just yeah it's a great conversation that we can probably continue um i really really encourage everyone to look into these wonderful books and i so appreciate all three of you for sharing your time and sharing your insights um, with us i also want to acknowledge that um kirti was here to help me which she's part of the um, cms in touch team as well so thank you so much you can't see her but she was here and helping um and i also want to quickly mention that um we are currently working on our schedule for the next year and we will add more events um when we actually um uh, create them and you can find them on the eventbrite page if you want to find that you can look the little uh, QR code. Um, you can email us if you have any suggestions for other events that we can do within the series or in general. Our YouTube channel has all of the recordings of all of our sessions, and you can also follow us um, through our Twitter account. So I really encourage you all to do that, and um, I hope you'll join me remotely in thanking these speakers for their time and their energy. Thank you very much. <laughs>